I've written a script for a video recounting personal experience. I'm not wearing a shirt. I've written a script for a video a while back recounting personal experiences of uh, different ways to stick it to your corporate overlord. Well, the script sucked and I never filmed it. Lee Camp's Moment of Clarity number 46 brought all this to the forefront again. If you haven't already, go to his YouTube channel and subscribe. He's awesome. Also, since writing that script, I have experienced wage theft directly and tangibly. I found out recently that just about everybody that I work with qualifies or is currently on food stamps. There are people who are in their 60s who do not have health insurance who are being told when they go to the health care clinic that they go to that they should go and apply for food stamps to free up their grocery budget to pay for more advanced medical procedures that they should be getting. That is fucked up. The fact that corporations are finding any way that they possibly can to avoid paying their employees the very basic wage that they need just to stay alive that is fucked up. It's also wage theft. But I'll also say that the best revenge is living well. Get back at your corporate overlords by being a better human being than they have it in their capacity to be. Their hearts are shaped like dollar signs and filled with dust and the tears of infants. Your heart is a heart-shaped heart and filled with love, which is probably part of the reason why you hate your job so much, because it requires you to take part in a system which is raping and killing the entire planet. If you hate your job, don't take it out on your customers. They probably don't want to shop at your shitty box store, but they have to because they have three kids and have a shit job that pays shit wages just like yours. If you work in fast food and you hate your job, don't spit in the food. Give food away for free. Give people more food than they ordered. Supersize everything without charging people for it. Take that, those little paper bags that you put the Happy Meals in. Fill that with three pounds of french fries and two apple pies. Give it away for free at random. If you work at Walmart and you hate your job, don't be a dick to the customers. They're poor people just like you. Be super nice to people. Make sure that every day that you're manning the register, there's a clearance sale with 90% off everything in the electronics department. If you know the front end manager's codes, these discounts don't even show up in accounting. But be sure not to discount anything from the impulse buy section because those do. If you work in a shitty mega box store on the floor doing stupid jobs that serve no purpose, make sure to do a really good job. Take your time. Sure, maybe the only thing that you get done all day is the first four feet of that shelf, but now all those tiny little bottles of nail polish are perfectly lined up with their SKU numbers. And isn't that what the management wants? You're just doing exactly what they wanted. If a customer interrupts you to try to find something in the store, Drop everything you're doing and go help them. In fact, take a scenic route. Make several deliberate laps around the store. It's good cardio for both you and the customer. Do you work for the military and had a, the sudden realization that all that honor and duty crap is bullshit, and in reality you're just killing brown people in oil-rich nations the world over, and that your function is just as an expendable pawn for transnational corporations? Well, stop complying with orders. Don't do anything, ever. Or maybe spend some time pretending that you're listening to Lady Gaga while making uh, copies of classified materials and then send it to WikiLeaks. I'm sure you've got more ideas. Post them in the comments below or send them to me at punkpatriot411 at gmail.com. I'll read the ones that I like best in a follow-up video. Anybody can do this. We are strong and there's more of us than they are of them. Throw a wrench in the gears. Stop going passively along like sheep to the slaughter. Stand your ground. You're a human being and you are powerful. Solidarity 2.0
Rabbi Arik Asherman, Executive Director of Rabbis for Human Rights. Uh, in 2000, when the Intifada, Second Intifada broke out, I said, from my analysis of history, of recent history, uh, that this round of violence would probably go from five to ten years until people would get exhausted and we would get back to a peace process. Uh, many people thought that was optimistic at the time. Uh, the second Intifada did start to die down after five years or so, uh, and there was a period of uh, hope that maybe something would move forward. Uh, today we're in a very liminal place. Uh, I've been warning for about the last year that we are potentially, uh, that we are extremely close to a second intif a third intifada. When I uh, traveled around in September, August, September of 2009 to uh, get ready for the olive harvest and met with mayors and farmers and the anger and frustration was visibly growing. Actually over the last year that's gone down a bit. Uh, there have been, there, there is some improvement in terms of Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian economy. Uh, the fact that the Israeli government has removed some major roadblocks uh, and improved freedom of movement and goods and services has been helpful. Uh, but the, it's very tense, and the tension has only continued to grow in East Jerusalem, where uh, a month or so ago, I, for the first time, I had my car stoned in, in, in Jerusalem, uh, coming uh, out of Sewan from, from, from a friend's house, uh, where there are places today where I would not go without accompaniment uh, by a Palestinian, which was not the case before. Uh, I was really holding my breath uh, just a few weeks ago after the private settler security guard shot and killed a Palestinian man and then a couple of days later during the protests, uh, a baby in Issaouiya died of tear gas inhalation and these things. And I, uh, I thought this could be it. It wasn't. And maybe I should take that as a positive sign that, that there are enough forces that don't want this to happen. But the challenge is uh, that, of course, nobody wants a 30 divided. But... Uh, no one planned the, the, the first or second intifadas either. It's just when there's dry tinder, it takes a match to light, light, light a conflagration. So from that point of view, I'm very worried. Uh, ultimately, I remain optimistic. Uh, you might ask me why. <laughs> and I might have a hard time answering you. But I, um, I guess it's part of a religious personality. I, and, I get, and I think it's because it is so clear both from my personal experience and from public opinion polls, that there is a same majority of Israelis and Palestinians who want a better future for themselves and their children. Uh, at some point, that has to come into play. Uh, it's true that right now we have um, weak governments on both sides, uh, and it's just not clear uh, whether there will be the will to move forward to peace or the ability to do that. Uh, but at some point, the fact that this is the desire of the vast majority of Israelis and Palestinians has to bring us to a better place. Uh, I think I think that uh, in the meantime, our job in the human rights community is admittedly on the micro level, but that's a very important thing. It's uh, most people are focused on the peace process. That's the brass ring. Uh, there was even, uh, back in the heady days of Oslo, uh, a debate between uh, Betselem and a well-known left-wing politician, Yossi Sarweed, who said, if we have to cut some corners in terms of human rights uh, to get to cut to the chase and get to the peace treaty, which is just around the corner, then so be it, because peace will improve human rights as well. And that's true. Pro peace will improve human rights. But what that fails to take into account is one of the reasons 
uh, with all the debates between the, Israel's different military intelligence organizations, whether the Second Intifada was spontaneous or planned, uh, we didn't need to hear that debate because we'd been predicting the Second Intifada a year and a half before it happened, simply because we saw that in the same way that Israelis were coming, becoming disillusioned with the peace process, when the Palestinian Authority was unwilling or unable to stop terror, average Palestinians no longer believed this was a peace process when human rights violations were going on at the same pace, and sometimes even at a greater pace, during the Oslo years than before. And this is what made uh, the Palestinian society ripe for the Second Intifada, even though I think the historians will ultimately say that this was a disaster for the Palestinian people, uh, as well as, of course, the tremendous loss of life on both sides. Uh, and so we have to remember the connection between the micro and the macro. Uh, yes, it's true that peace will help improve human rights. But if you, it's those insignificant, quote unquote, human rights violations uh, that set a tone, that send a message to your average Israelis and average Palestinians about what's possible. Uh, and people have to have hope for the future. Um, sometimes, uh, and that's incredibly important, it's also incredibly important that we're there on the ground breaking down the stereotypes between, uh, because, because even though there's that same majority of Israelis and Palestinians that want a compromise negotiated agreement, there's even a higher percentage of both sides that say, we want peace, the other side doesn't. And then there's no incentive to move forward when you think there's nobody to reciprocate on the other side. Uh, sometimes I think even more important than anything we've done to prevent or, or address, readdress or, or re, re, rescind human rights abuses is what we've done to break down stereotypes. And ultimately, only we as Israelis can empower Palestinian peacemakers uh, by breaking down the stereotypes held by the fellow Palestinians so that they're willing to listen to their peacemakers. Only Palestinians can empower me to be heard by my fellow Israelis. And so those are the things that we have to do. Um, I'm hopeful, among other reasons, because I don't intend to quit. And, and I know that what we're eventually going to do is with God's help, we're going to create the reality that we need to bring a better future for all of us. Thank you.